and what we're going to be talking about today is the importance of a living trust for real estate investors and how you want to make sure that you're preserving your estate going forwards. I get a lot of questions on this and uh, it, you know, people are always wondering, what type of a plan should I set up, Clint? I got these LLCs, I got these properties. What should I be doing? And so what I wanted to do was talk about the steps you should be focusing on and why you should be looking at, at our estate planning when it comes to being a real estate investor, the importance of it. And, and it really comes back to you know, my own personal life. When I was growing up, uh, both sides of my family were destroyed over poorly drafted estate plans. And it really cemented into me the importance of putting together a plan that ensures that the assets that you are creating now, that they're gonna be passed on uh, to your beneficiaries when you're no longer here and you're not gonna create chaos, which has happened so many times. Uh, you probably know some people where you know, when they passed away, the kids started fighting over the assets. That can be a problem. Or, or one child uh, exerts undue influence and, and takes more than what they're entitled to. So all of these things uh, can come up. And the other questions, you know, problems that you have uh, when it comes to estate planning is that how do we preserve these assets that, that we've worked on, on building up so we know that they're going to pass on to multiple generations? And it's not like that scenario where uh, my my wife's uncle, when uh, his his or his wife's parents passed away, you know they inherited some money. What did they do with it? They went out, took that money, sold the house, and bought some fancy new cars. These are things that you know they don't follow on what you've been doing. You know the reason why we're investing is for many of us is to create, of course, income, but also to create a legacy of wealth that these assets can continue to produce income for multiple generations. And in order to ensure that they're gonna be there for two or three generations down the line, you should look at creating a plan around that to make sure that they're gonna be protected, that when you're no longer here, that the, your, your beneficiaries or your children's children, whoever that is, doesn't look back and say, you know what, I'm gonna sell those because I really wanna go on a trip to Europe. And they just took what you've created in that income stream, that ATM, which that property can be, and blowing it because they don't appreciate what it is that you've done. So that's why I think estate planning is so crucial um, when it comes to real estate investing, it goes hand in hand. And the thing about it is that so many individuals always wanna talk about the LLCs, the corporations, and we tend to avoid the other side of it, the estate plan, passing it on because we don't see that as so much of the protection side. It's like, oh, we can get to that later on. Well, you never know what's going to happen. Uh, there's an individual that I golf with, um, and I say golf lightly because I just started picking up this bad habit uh, less than a year ago, and I'm, I'm horrible at it, but they, they, they humor me. A couple, about a month and a half ago, we were scheduled to, to, to go out on Wednesday, what we normally like to do, and uh, he, he sent us a text to the group, and he said, I can't make it. Um, one of my sons just found out he passed away. Uh, unexpectedly and his other son on the exact same day riding a motorcycle was hit by a car and put in the emergency room they didn't think he was going to make it so you can under appreciate the stress that this individual now is under but my point is is that both of these kids when i say kids they're almost my age um, they one of them was passed away and the other one was put in the hospital and they didn't think he was going to make it he did survive but things like this can happen uh, on an instance notice. And you're out there building up the, these plans and buying this real estate. And then the next thing you know, you're, you're out. Who's gonna pick up the pieces? That's why planning is so important. You put so much effort into this, we gotta create a plan to protect it. Okay, so what do we wanna do then? Let me just go over here to my, my whiteboard that you always see me draw on. Well, when it comes to planning for real estate investors, I tell people that you can set up the entities. There's no reason why you, you can't set up LLCs first. So, so don't make that mistake um, that thinking that you, you have to do this in a specific order. There isn't a specific order about what, what I'm sharing with you. But what you should be looking at is taking everything that you've created and then putting that into a, a living trust. Okay, That should be your estate plan. 
Not a will. I mean, a lot of people think, well, if I just draft a will, I'm going to be fine. I prefer to use living trust because a living trust avoids probate. That's the best reason to do this, and that is to avoid probate. Now, maybe some of you have been through the probate process before, but if you have limited liability companies that you've set up, LLCs that you own right here, and you, you, maybe your personal residence is over here and you have vehicles here and you have your personal savings account and checking account there, and maybe you've set up another LLC over here uh, to hold your investing cash. All of these assets that you own in your name, all right, because I hold all these in my name. I'm a member of my LLC. Uh, I'm an owner of my property. When I pass away, if I've created a will, I'm gonna have to go through this probate process here which is gonna require an attorney to step in and handle the estate with whoever executor that I've appointed my will to ensure that these assets get passed on to my beneficiaries. Or maybe it's maybe you leave behind a spouse and it's gonna to go to your spouse. Well, how's she gonna feel um, if there's chaos left in your wake and doesn't know where the assets are, doesn't know how to take control of the assets and there's an attorney there, of course, charging to dispense this advice to assist with the passing on of this. So when it comes to thinking about planning i tell people you want to set up a living trust you don't want to leave it to a will because you're going to go through the probate process which the court then is going to step in with the attorney and they're going to typically they could drag their feet and if you're a real estate investor just think about this who's going to start working with the tenants right you got the attorney there does he have any experience when it comes to dealing with real estate probably not maybe a little but these are problems that arise and you could have a tenant stay in your property now for six months. They quit paying rent because you're no longer around. And so they figure they don't have to or someone shows up at their door and they say, hey, uh, my dad passed away and I'm here to collect rent. I don't know you, I'm not paying you any money. So you can imagine some of the, the issues that would come that, that might arise. So what we wanna do is create this living trust. And, and what is the living trust? Think of it as a box. You create this big box here, we'll call it our living trust, and you're gonna set it up while you're alive, and it, it's another entity. And if I set this up here, I would have myself and my wife, we're gonna both be trustees of this trust, and we're gonna be beneficiaries of the trust. Now the trust doesn't offer any asset protection, so this is not an asset protection play while you're alive. I'll explain how it will after you've passed on. But I'm gonna create this trust, and that trust is going to have a set of instructions inside of it. So the trusts that we create typically range anywhere from 80 to 120, 130 pages in length, depending on the complexity of the estate plan, as I will explain. And so the purpose of this trust is to take whatever is held inside of it and pass those assets onto your beneficiaries in a manner in which you would like them to receive the assets. So sometimes people refer to this as having control when you're no longer here. Okay, there's, there's great ways to do this through a living trust. You can ensure that your wishes, your desires, your belief systems will continue on when you're no longer here because your beneficiaries in order to benefit will have to abide by the terms of the trust. And so what I'm, what I'm starting to seed here into this conversation is that we're not going to set it up many times so that when we're gone, the assets go right out to our kids. We're going to, or our beneficiaries, we're gonna put some strings. We're gonna attach strings to it to ensure that they're gonna do the things that we expect of them when we're no longer here to guide them. So the way the trust works is you create this, this document, you sign the document, it's not registered anywhere, it's a private document, and then you need to start funding it, okay? So we need to start putting our assets into it. So many times people come to me and they have an LLC set up here with a, with a rental property into it, they have their personal residence here. So what we'll do is we'll have to assign over, we'll transfer in these assets. So your house would be deeded into your living trust. Or if it's held in a land trust, like I use for, for asset protection purposes for a personal residence, then we would assign uh, your beneficial interest into your living trust. So your living trust will actually become the member in your LLC. It will become the beneficiary of your land trust. So you're gonna do this with all of your titable assets. And so many times what you'll find is somebody will have a living trust that looks like this. They'll have a Wyoming LLC right here. 
that has their living trust as a member, and then they're gonna have their real estate LLCs up here, all held by that one Wyoming limited liability company. Maybe they have a corporation that they use for property management to manage their, their assets. That would be in their living trust. So, that, so the shareholder of their corp or their LLC tax as a corporation would list their living trust. And then their land trust would also be inside of there that holds their personal residence. They would put their personal checking account inside of there. So all your title assets are gonna go into your, your, your trust and it's gonna control them. Now, here's something that you have to be aware of or you should be aware of. When you're placing assets into a living trust, I mean, so once you set this up, as you go along and you, you start to acquire more assets, let's, so let's say that I have my living trust set up here, I had my personal residence inside of it, and maybe you don't have a blue box yet, you just have one LLC that holds a rental property here in Texas. And now you decide you're going to invest in Indiana. So you're gonna create another limited liability company and you wanna set it up so that the living trust is the initial member. Because once your trust is in existence, you can list it as the member on your LLCs, which means it's gonna be the owner. Of course, you could still be the manager of this entity, but your trust would be the member. Why do we want the trust on there? Because if the asset's not held inside of the trust, the trust isn't listed on the LLC as its member, then you're gonna be back to this. You're gonna go through the probate process. And I've seen plenty of situations where real estate investors have set up a living trust. And I, actually, I just dealt with this with one of my own clients uh, a year ago. When he passed away, we set up a living trust. His business interests were held inside of there. Well, he had set up another entity. Didn't even tell me about it. Didn't call me. I was a little, a little upset about that. Um, it set up this business entity and it's hanging out here. It wasn't listed in his trust. That means the member of this LLC was my client who had since deceased. So we had all of this stuff set up so we didn't have to go through the probate process. I just told uh, the successor trustee, which was his son, here's what you got to do. You got your living trust set up. It specifies that you get this LLC. So we just need to transfer the LLC out of the trust to you individually. Uh, your sister is going to get the house. So we're going to deed the property out of the trust to her individually. So he started doing all this without having to go to court. He did it all, just sign the documents, boom, and it happens. Now, the problem in the, this scenario was that this entity right here wasn't transferred into the trust. So I had to open up a probate in Pierce County to transfer the ownership interest of this limited liability company through his pour over will, because we always create a backup. Whenever we create a living trust, you always want to create a will as a backup, just in case you forget like this individual did. So we had to create, we had, I had to go to court, obtain letters of testamentary, open up the probate process, transfer the the LLC that was not held in the name of the trust to the living trust through the probate. Then we distributed it out to the sister because she was supposed to get that limited liability company. And then I went in, I had to close the probate. So it cost him a couple thousand dollars for me to deal with this one asset that should have been held in the trust itself. So that's why I'm saying when you set up a living trust, you want to put your assets into it. You always want to keep it funded. So if you set up another limited liability company, it's going to go into your living trust. Now, here's something that again, I'm circling back, what you need to know about this. So in this case, I said we had a Texas LLC in here. Now I want to create an Indiana limited liability company. And I just told you, you want your Indiana limited liability company in the name of your trust. Well, when you're setting up the Indiana LLC, the way you should do it is as follows. Set up the LLC here in Indiana to hold my rental property in your name as the member. Then assign your interest, your membership to your living trust. So then you'll come back with another piece of paper and you just write on here, you know, I, Clint Coons, hereby assign 100% of my membership interest in the red box to the Coons Family Trust dated March 1st, 2000. And then you, you put that with the document. So now we've transferred our LLC into our trust. But here's what I haven't done. 
I haven't altered my operating agreement. Now, this is important, and here's why. Because when you are dealing with third parties that, with respect to this, this entity right here, let's say you're gonna open a bank account or you're gonna sell the property in the future, most of the time they're gonna ask, that is title would ask or the bank's gonna ask for, for your operating agreement. I just dealt with this today. They ask for a copy of your operating agreement. If you send over the operating agreement and they see that the member of the LLC is a living trust, you know what they're gonna ask for next? Your living trust. And so now you get into this where you have to keep giving them documents and they're going through them, their illegals looking at them. So my method is when I set up an LLC, I list myself, maybe my wife's on here together, we're both members. We set it up in our name, so I have the operating agreement that shows uh, us as the initial member or you know our Wyoming LLC but then we transfer the ownership interest into the trust via an assignment so when someone asks for a copy of my legal documents they will never see the living trust listed as a member all that's handled behind the scenes because that just leads to additional questions so this is part of the the, the aspect uh, about trust in, in estate planning for real estate investors you should be aware of is that you need to set up this estate plan and we're going to go through why that is here in a minute what it can do for you but when you go to fund it and start putting your assets into it do not change any of your documents to list the living trust as the member they should it should not appear on those llc's do it all via an assignment the only time the trust should appear on a public record is going to be when if you deed your personal residence directly in then your living trust name could show up there but other than that, it, should, it shouldn't be out there because it just complicates your life going forwards when you're trying to deal with third parties. All right, so the idea here now is we wanna get our trust fully funded. So as we continue to, to make investments, let's say you're doing this. Okay, I've got my trust here. And say your strategy, you've been following what I, what, what I talk about, set up a Wyoming LLC and you're setting up separate LLCs in the states where you're owning your real estate, like this. And when you set up these LLCs, because you want anonymity, we're making the Wyoming LLC the member of these red boxes. All right, so now you're gonna buy a third property. So now I'm ready to purchase my third property here in New Hampshire, and I'm gonna create a new limited liability company. So when I create this new LLC, if I want anonymity, then I'm going to make my Wyoming LLC the member. I'm not gonna use this strategy here because I'm using the Wyoming LLC as its member. And as soon as I make the Wyoming LLC the member of my red box here in New Hampshire, guess what? This New Hampshire LLC is now held by default in my living trust. Why? Because the living trust owns the blue box. The blue box owns the red box. Now, a lot of people get confused on this. They say, well, Clint, I need to transfer my New Hampshire LLC into my living trust. No, you don't. Another way to, look, to think about it, if you want to look at it, is this. Here, here's my trust. Here's my Wyoming LLC. And then here are my red boxes. Okay, just like this. So you've seen, some of you, you know, I'm talking about here, if you're older like I am, uh, those, we were kids, they had these little, wooden dolls. I thought they came from Russia or somewhere like that from Europe. And you, there's a big doll and you take the head off the big doll and inside's another little doll and you take the head off that one. There's another little doll inside of that one. They're all little wooden, wooden dolls that were hollow. This is what you have here. This, this, this living trust, that is that big doll. And inside of this is the next size doll. So wherever that big doll goes, so goes everything else it holds. And that's what we're doing with that living trust. When we put those red boxes into our Wyoming LLC, you're stacking all the assets into the blue box. So when you pass away, wherever you decide you want this blue box to be distributed, let's say I wanted the blue box to go to, to, to my son and daughter as equal members. Well, when they give them the blue box right here, they by default get all of the red boxes because it goes with the blue box. Now, that's basically how a trust works. And, and keep in mind, no probate here. All of this takes place in your, or whoever's controlling your estate, in their office, in their house. You don't need to bring in 
any type of legal representation. I mean, you could consult an attorney, but it's not necessary because you don't need anything other than a death certificate to handle these types of transactions. And I've dealt with hundreds of people that have set up living trusts. Even my, my wife's grandmother passed away. I created a living trust for her and, and her eldest daughter was named the successor trustee. And she did it all on her own, transferred uh, real estate, bank accounts, because she was in control. She did not need my assistance. We didn't have to open up a probate. So then when it comes to living trust, how does it function? Okay. So when you create a living trust, let's say you're married, there's two of you right here. The way it works is you put all your assets into here, and I'm assuming that you're holding them joint. If you have assets that you want to keep separate, that's more complicated than I'm going to get into today, but there's ways to separate out assets. If you say, hey, I brought assets in from a prior marriage, I want to keep them separate. We can do that inside of one trust, or maybe you set up separate trusts. But you put all your assets inside of here like this. Boom, I got my house inside of here. Um, maybe my, my business is inside of there. So all that's inside of my living trust. Now, when the first spouse passes away, the survivor has full control, full control over the trust. So while you're alive, both of you have control. When the first spouse passes, the survivor has control. So, so if that's what you desire, you want your spouse to have complete control, then typically that's the way we would set up a living trust. The spouse gets full control after I'm gone. Now, what's great about the living trust is you can also put provisions in there. Let's assume, you know, in my instance, in my case, you know, you've heard me talk about my real estate investments. Now, my wife, she knows about the real estate investments, but she's not an investor. She wouldn't know how to run those investments, um, how to, you know, just, Deal with, deal with the property. So what we've ensured is that when so, if something were to happen to me, we have a provision in there that she's in complete control. However, I have an advisor to assist in understanding what needs to be done to look over the real estate investments to make sure that no one's taking advantage of my wife and saying, oh, well, you know, the rent this month, we, have a, we had high capex. No, no, I want somebody that understands real estate looking that over. So, so we specified in the trust that this would be an advisor to assist with that if, if I'm no longer here. So I'm protecting her interests. I want to make sure that she feels comfortable that if, if something happens to me that she's not going to be scrambling trying to figure out where everything is, which is why this is really important as well. And the mistake that I see sometimes that couples make is one spouse takes the attitude, well, I do it all. And then I'm going to you know, keep all the information close to my chest. And then that person is unexpectedly killed. And then the question is the survivors looking around going, what do we have? I don't know where the money is. I don't know where to control things. So whenever you, if you're married, think strongly or think seriously on this, you should make sure that your spouse is on all your bank accounts for your entity. So even if that spouse does not participate in it, they have access to those funds that the spouse knows what you have, your business interests, your LLCs, where they're set up, wh the bank accounts for those, who the property manager is, the real estate that's held inside of them. And this is one thing that I, we do with our estate plan is that every few months, three to four months, we will go in and we will update a list. So inside of our living trust, I have a, a, an Excel, well, I print it off of Excel, but it just, just it's just spreadsheets and it just lists out all the business interests and the properties that are held, where they're located, the addresses, the bank accounts, all the financial information with every account that, that we own. And so that if something happens to one of us, boom, you know where to go. We also, you should make sure that passwords to get into these accounts online, those are listed out somewhere else, hide them somewhere. Okay. But then tell us, make sure somebody knows where to go find them. Cause these are all the things that, that, that come up, uh, that create problems when they're no longer here. Now I see some of you are put, posting questions. Great. I'm going to get to those questions here. Uh, as soon as I get through with this, I'll just start running through the questions. Now, the way the trust is set up is that when first spouse passes away, survivor takes over. Now, if you're not married, then you're going to be in this next scenario that I'm about to refer to. So when the survivor passes away, then what you've not, you should have nominated are successor trustees. Okay. 
Now the successor trustees are individuals that you've appointed to oversee the disposition, the, the distribution of your assets or possibly control your assets. So think of it like an executor of an estate. That is their role. My wife's grandmother's eldest daughter was her successor trustee. Okay, so my client who passed away, his son was his successor trustee. So he handled the distribution of the estate. Now where people I, I feel can create issues for themselves, it's right here. Who do you choose to be your successor trustee? Let's say that you had two kids. This child, she's 13 and he's nine. Are you going to name your kids as your successor trustee? I mean, come on, if you did that, what are they going to do? You pass away, they're 16 and, and uh, 20, and maybe they decide they're going to liquidate out the estate and they're going to go spend the time in Disneyland. Who, you, know, you never know what, what, what kids would do, not to mention you have to be at least 18 years old to be a trustee. So there's a maturity level there. You wouldn't want to necessarily name your children as successor trustees of your estate for that reason. They're not old enough. Now, you can always put into a trust hey, uh, I'm going to have these individual serve as successor trustees, but if my, my kids are at least 40 years of age when we pass, then they can be a successor trustee. So when you create a living trust, you can get really creative uh, with the drafting to ensure that your desires are going to be carried out so you don't have to go back and keep changing things. That's something I tell people about a well-drafted estate plan. It shouldn't have to be changed. If you do it right the first time, it will be forward thinking and it will look at possible changes that may come up in your life and it will address those changes for you so you don't have to worry about, oh, well, uh, my kids are 40 now and I want them to be successor trustee because I chose my dad and he's 85 and I don't think he has the wherewithal to handle that any longer. So I need to go back to the attorney and pay the attorney to redraft this provision. No, that should have already been done. So there's always this natural inclination to want to make our children our successor trustees. But herein lies the problem. What happens if you don't want to leave your assets outright to your kids? Okay, and, and you might be wondering, well, why would you do that? Well, one of the benefits of having a living trust is that you can preserve these assets in trust for multiple generations. You don't have to distribute them out. So you could set up your living trust here. Okay, we set it up in 2022. Uh, you pass away in 2062, and then the trust states that it's gonna be available for your two kids, but we're not going to distribute out the assets that are held inside of there. We have uh, some LLCs that we've set up like this. These are, this is all the real estate that we have right here. Maybe you have a personal residence here and you have your, your savings account over here, your personal checking account, and then your cars and things like that. You could specify in your trust the following. You could say, well, when we pass away, we, you can take the personal residence, you can take the cash minus X amount of dollars in reserves and split those between the kids and, you know, vehicles and personal effects, distribute that all. But all of our real estate, we want it to stay inside of this trust. And I wanna make sure that the income that comes from our real estate investing is distributed to our kids on a quarterly basis, annual basis. You could just specify it like that. So now what you've done is you've ensured that any assets that remain inside of here will be protected from their creditors because they're not being distributed. When, when you pass away your living trust, it's revocable and then when you pass away, it becomes irrevocable. So creditors can't get after the assets. If you had a kid going through a divorce or they're being sued because of a bit failed business venture, creditors aren't gonna be able to get those assets. They're gonna be there protected for your children. So you can set it up so that they, they have these assets, they get the income off their real estate. And then let's say they pass away in a uh, 20, I don't know, long time. They pass away a little bit later and they each leave, left behind two children each. Well, now what will happen is then the trust would start paying out to these four children, the income. And again, the assets are preserved inside of the trust. So that income stream keeps going to them for multiple generations. That's why I mean this can create legacy wealth through a living trust. And you don't 
have the fear then that maybe this child decides, oh, I want to sell half of these assets and, and go on a trip or buy a vacation property. No, I make, I've been making these investments so that we can build a foundation of which you can continue to grow and hopefully you'll, you'll uh, continue with the trend of investing in real estate. And so that's why when I look at the creating an estate plan, I question clients to say, what is your true motivation? Do you want this to last beyond multiple generations? And if the answer to that question is yes, then you don't want to leave the assets outright to your kids. Keep them in trust. Let them get the benefit of the income, distribute it to them, but don't let them have the control. Now, some people say, well, I trust them. That's fine. You can trust your son. But remember, there are influences in his life or your daughter's life where there's a spouse here and that spouse could say, I don't like real estate. What I want you to do is sell. Okay, I would rather we have this, you know, we want a boat. Okay, that's really important. And you know, your child gets worn down eventually and they want to keep their spouse happy, so they sell it. So you can see that that could happen. And so if you have it in trust, it gives them plausible deniability. I can't do anything about it. It's in trust, it's locked up, I have no control. So you can tell me you like this all you want, but I cannot influence them, I'm sorry. So that's their escape. But the thing about doing all of this comes back to then who do you choose as your successor trustees? Obviously you wouldn't wanna put your kids there. Okay, you're gonna to wanna to choose someone else. And this is again, another mistake that I see happen when it comes to estate planning that people will choose successor trustees. I'm talking about real estate investors. Their successor trustees have no idea how to run real estate or what real estate is about. And what they end up doing is selling because they understand cash and it's just easier for them to sell the cash. So what I like to, uh, I, I recommend people do is that they choose someone that they know that has some real estate in their background and of course younger than you and ask them if they would be willing to serve as their, your successor trustee. And maybe you give them the power to appoint other people when they're no longer there with that same background. So they continue to keep a real estate investor involved in this trust. Now you can have multiple trustees. So I just set up a trust not too long ago where we chose two trustees, one trustee to control the real estate and this trustee over here to control distributions to the kids. So this trustee is controlling the real estate. The money comes down. That's, that's getting a little messy. So what I have is a scenario like this, LLCs all held into the trust. We have one trustee here controlling the properties and dealing with the property managers. And then I had another trustee over here who was dealing with the money. So this individual deals with the properties, the money comes down, the money gets dumped into the trust bank account. And then this person here who knows the, kid, the, the beneficiaries that, that, that is a family member would then be responsible for making distributions to the kids per the terms of the trust document. So there we're working with two trustees involved. So you can have multiple trustees. Now, if you watch my living trust video that I have on my channel, you probably heard me talk about how I, how we set up our estate plan. So in our estate plan, I took it one step further in our estate plan. I wanted to ensure that, that our children, we wanted, I say, I, I mean, we, my wife and I wanted to ensure that, that our kids are going to continue on the path that we'd set out for them when we raised them. You know, we're, I, would, I guess my daughter would say we're kind of strict, but it, it we raised them a certain way and we expect, told them, hey, you don't get nothing free out of life. You get out of it life what you put into life. And if you don't want to put anything in it out of life, then it's not going to give you anything. And so the choice is yours. Our trust adopts that same philosophy that if we were no longer here, something happened to us tomorrow. And let's say that our, our estate generates uh, $800,000 a year in income. And we have two children and they're 50 50, right? Are they going to get $400,000 each? No, it would depend on what they're doing in their lives. If my, our son decided, hey, 400 grand, that's a ton of money to me. I, I, why would I continue to work? I'm going to go climb mountains and, and play video games and maybe raise bees. All right, great, do that. And if you make some money doing any of those activities, let's say you make $6,000 a year, 
then you're going to get some distributions. You're going to get $6,000 in distributions from the trust. All right, so I'm not going to reward you for sitting around and not being productive. I want you to take what, what we have done and grow it. If you, don't want, if you don't have any interest and you just want to sit around, then you, we're not going to incentivize that type of behavior. That's what I meant by you can use a trust to foster your beliefs, what's important to you, to make sure that that's carried on through multiple generations. Now, you can also, you know, what we baked into ours is that if you choose certain career paths that we, we think are valuable, say you go into the military or you want to be a teacher, uh, you want to get involved in charitable work or you want to be a stay-at-home parent, like our daughter wants to be a stay-at-home mom eventually, great, we value that. So then you'll receive distributions if you do these certain things. And here's how that distribution will be calculated. So that's the power of having a living trust. It allows you to get granular. And some people say, well, that's just, I've seen it before. Well, I can't believe you're going to do that when you're no longer here. Remember, these are my, your assets. No one has the right to tell you what you can do with your assets. I have plenty of people say, well, just, I'm just going to give them to, I trust their decision-making authority. Great. Do that. doesn't matter doesn't mean I won't change Tracy and I won't change our minds later on. We could and make that decision. But right now, that's where it is, especially the fact that the kids are younger. So when your children are younger, you want to have a lot of provisions in there to protect them from making the mistakes that we all made when we were young. You know, and so why force, why risk the assets? I remember I was dating this girl in high school and her brother was involved in a car accident. And he got hit by a drunk driver and he received a settlement of $275,000, And I was talking to her dad, and I think it was 17 at the time. I said, are you going to give him that money? He goes, well, yeah, he earned it. Uh, well, it's his money. I said, but you, you know what he's probably going to do with it, right? Well, he'll have to learn. Well, here's what happened. Within six months, so I dated her for about six months, he had moved out and he moved back in and he blew everything. But here's what he had to show for it. A truck, a Toyota Tacoma or some type of Toyota truck with these big tires where you needed a ladder to get into it. He was bringing back in the big screen TVs and the speakers. I helped them bring it back in. His dad was the one that got the benefit of all this stuff because he blew it all. So why? Because the kid was 18 or 19 years old and they allowed him to take all those funds and do what he wanted with it. He made a huge mistake. I bet he regrets that to this day. When you have a living trust, that won't happen because you'll have provisions built into it to ensure that kids can't make these mistakes that we're, they're prone to make. And that's why I encourage real estate investors, I say for your state plan, here, here's my rule is that if you have children, you need to have a living trust set up. If you're married, set up a living trust. If you have assets, real property, you need to have a living trust. If you're not there yet, if, if you're, you know, you got an apartment, you don't have children, you don't have your, a rental property yet, then it's not necessary, all right? Then it would be overkill. And I would tell you, don't consider that yet. Get some investments going. But as you start to progress and you start to acquire things, then you need to seriously look at it. If you don't have children, then maybe you're going to hold your assets in trust for your cat, all right? You may think, what the heck's that about? I mean, I love my cats. Um, and you can, I've set up trust before where the assets are held in trust for cats. And here's something to consider too. If you leave trust to animals, make sure that if you want the assets to be held in trust for animals that you love, that the successor beneficiaries, that means, you know, when, when, uh, when this cat passes away and you, then you say, well, then, then the trust is going to go to the kids. You better make sure you have a provision in there that states that if the cat dies from anything other than natural causes they get nothing. Why? Well, it incentivizes your kids not to come over here and whack the cat one day in order to get access to the assets. First mistake I made when I was uh, when I started practicing law and I, and I drafted a trust. That cat got whacked. So you can tie it down. And that's why I enjoy creating the living trust because of the flexibility that is built into it. All right, so I'm going to start taking some of these questions here that um, ha have come up here. And go through it and some of them may not be on the living trust and, and they have to do with other things uh mia all right so oh that's a little small you want to know hey clint i appreciate all your videos and advice uh still in the middle of the 1031 exchange with contact you when i'm done all right great mia yeah good that 1031 is going forwards I, I i was corresponding with her um on my channel uh about what, some things to do there 
Okay, where are we at here? Um, wrong plan, let me get down here. People, people ask Clint, all right, here we go. Um, people ask, if I have already set up an LLC, I don't know why this isn't larger here. If I've already set up an LLC, can uh, I open a holding LLC in Wyoming and have properties in a series LLC? All right, so the idea is can you create a series limited liability company um, if you already have an LLC set up in Texas? All right, so, so really what it comes down to with this question all right. Um, is do I do you would you need to set up a series LLC? Let's say you have a Texas LLC right here, and now you want to create a Wyoming LLC, and you're thinking about setting it up as a series. Should you go ahead and do that, and then possibly I guess put your Texas LLCs into these separate cells associated with the Wyoming series? I wouldn't do that. And the reason I would not create a, a Wyoming series LLC is that each of these cells have to be registered with the state. So that's an additional cost. I know in Texas you have to register them as well. But I think the better strategy here that would make more sense if you continue to invest in Texas is take your existing Texas LLC, convert it to a series, a Texas series LLC. So now this becomes a, a series LLC in Texas, same LLC, it's just change it. You, you amend your articles uh, of organization. And so now you can create cells and you take that real estate that you had in the name of the parent and you transfer it into a cell. And then each new cell or each new property you buy, you put it in a new cell and have a Wyoming LLC down here own the parent series and each of these cells are held right there. That's how you would do it. I think that would be a better structure. I think it's cleaner. Texas offers a series LLC It's uh, to, to set up the cells. You don't have to register them. You have to get a DBA. That takes three minutes uh, to register the DBA with the state. I don't know what it was, $15 or something like that, and you're done. So if you're using it, if, if, to, in answer to your question, this is, I think, would be the uh, better way to go. Now, if you want to learn more about this, I actually I'm teaching an event this Saturday. Uh, you just it's it, we've got it in the notes uh, how to get how to, to to register for it. But if you want to to join me, uh, you just go to aba. link. Okay, just type that in, and then I think it's Clint Coons Live is what is what you would do there. Yeah, Clint Coons Live. Clint. Coons live and you can register for the event. It's no cost, but we're going to cover it, that type of strategy in depth on the event this Saturday. So if you're wondering about a series LLC, I'll be showing you how to set that up. All right. Um, the next question that came up here, I just started my process on a living trust with Anderson. I, uh, I was already having a holding company in Delaware and many multifamily investments. What do we do with life insurance? All right, Tom. Life insurance, great question. So when you set up your living trust here, you have a life insurance policy over here. What would you wanna do with that? Well, if you're married, then your spouse would be the beneficiary. And then you turn, then you make the living trust the contingent beneficiary of your life insurance policy. Now, depending on the value of the policy, you may even wanna consider, you know, setting up what's called an irrevocable life insurance trust, a separate trust just for your life insurance policy. And the reason why you would do this is because depending on where the estate tax is gonna be sitting when you pass away, if you wanna ensure that, that those policy, the, the, the life insurance policy is not included in your estate for federal estate tax purposes or state death tax purposes, you can set up a trust that will do that, that will remove it from your estate. So if you're not going that, you're not ready for that process yet, then just make your living trust the contingent beneficiary. Your spouse will be the primary, your trust will be the contingent. When you pass away then, if, you don't, if your spouse isn't alive, it all goes into your living trust and it's distributed out from there. Um, all right. So next question here, what is the difference between 
an irrevocable and a revocable trust. So a revocable trust can be amended and changed during your lifetime. So as I stated, if I create a living trust and right now my kids, they're not the trustees, but if we later decide, Tracy and I, well, they can be the trustees of our trust. We can come back in and amend this trust to appoint them as our successor trustees. That's the benefit of having a revocable trust. You can make changes to it. We could even cancel it out if we wanted to. When you set up an irrevocable trust, your hands are tied. It's locked in stone. Many of the provisions are locked there and you can't make any changes to it. So we use irrevocable trust when we're looking for asset protection or we're trying, as I just described, to avoid having to pay uh, any estate tax on the life insurance proceeds when we pass away, because it's great for removing the assets from your estate. Um, next question here. Okay, how do trustees, here we go. How do, Janelle, how do trustee beneficiaries settle an estate when it's out of state? I would like to think it's cumbersome to do that. What trusted beneficiaries do you have in personal relationships that feel comfortable post grief, especially also an estate attorney having local resources and not to deal with a stranger from out of state? All right, Janelle, great question. So I think the way you would look at it, what we're talking about is a situation like this. You have a living trust set up and if you're using LLCs to own your real estate, Janelle, then it's simple. Right. Let's assume that I've set up, I have two rental properties and, and I'm not using Wyoming right now. You, you, you already set it up in your own name. You, you live in Florida. This property right here is in New Mexico and this one is in Nevada. Right. And you have one beneficiary down here, your daughter. Okay. And you pass away and she lives in Florida as well. So how does she transfer these assets to herself? All she has to do is change the ownership on the LLC to her name as the member, update the secretary of state, take your name off, put her name on. Now she's in control. You don't even have to go to those states to do anything. You can do all this online. Now, if you didn't have it set up this way, let's assume that the properties were never set up in LLCs. Now this, and again, this is why I like using LLCs because it makes it so easy. Now, in this instance, if these properties were not in limited liability companies, but they're in the name of your living trust and your daughter is a successor trustee, all she would need is a copy of your death certificate showing that you passed away. So she would get this death certificate here. Okay, so she would have that. She would then contact either an attorney or a title company in the state where the property is located if she wants to transfer it to her name and she would have a deed prepared, transferring it from the trust into her individual name. So she would prepare the deed. She would sign the deed as the trustee of your trust, transferring it from the trust to her individually. That's it. It's very simple. And, and to your point, when it's held in trust, it gives you more protection and prevents further or, or fraud that can take place, which is what really destroyed one side of my family. Uh, my maternal side is when an aunt started stealing assets. She got in there with power of attorney and started doing things she should have never done. So it's really simple to handle assets out of state as long as they're in the trust. If they're not in the trust, then it becomes really cumbersome. So if you, if you lived in Florida and you create your living trust, some people think, well, if I set it up in Florida, what happens if I move later on um, to Louisiana or another state, New Hampshire, do I have to change my trust? No, you do not. Can your Florida trust own property in California, Washington, Utah? Absolutely. It does not matter. When you create your trust, it's going to operate in all 50 states for you. All right. Great question. Um, Bob would like to know what property can go into a living trust. Bob, anything can go into a living trust that's a titable asset that your name appears on. So quite, you know, think about it this way. How about your IRA? Could you put your IRA into your trust? No, because your IRA is a trust. All right. You can't change the ownership on the IRA. It just can only be an individual. But what you can do is if you set your living trust up with the right provisions, 
you can make your living trust the beneficiary of your IRA. So similar to what I talked about earlier with the life insurance policy, here's my IRA, the way my IRA is set up, it first goes to Tracy. If Tracy isn't here, then it goes to the trust and the trust controls the distribution to the kids. So I have special provisions in the trust to accommodate an IRA to keep the tax deferred nature as long as possible by creating a sub trust for that IRA. So it's built into to, to your living trust. Um, what else do we have here? Okay, so what is the best age range for kids to receive a real estate portfolio? It's a difficult question because I don't know your kids. Uh, it really comes down to their maturity level, their interest in real estate. I can tell you that right now, um, you know, our daughter, she's, she has a few rental properties and she, she has a passion for real estate. So I'd feel comfortable bringing her in and giving her properties because I've, I've seen the way that she manages those properties. I mean, she doesn't let the PM slip by with a nickel and she's on them and she's always looking at the CapEx and when that, if that comes in and questioning it. So she could handle it. Uh, so, so you'll get a sense for that. Um, your kids, whether or not you'd want to appoint them and when they should have it. If, they, if you don't feel like it, then just keep it, keep it in trust as I talked about for, for a longer period of time. Maybe they never receive it outright. It stays in trust, for, so then it's held for their children. Um, all right, so another question Janelle wants. Specifically setting up estates often involves, let me just make this a little bigger here. So, um, often involves financial insurance, retirement advisors, local real estate professionals. I'm seeing this happen now, it's a huge problem for them. Do you have experts or referrals for each state? We do not have referrals for each state um, when it comes to, to, to dealing with the professional there, unfortunately. I mean, we have offices in a few different states, Utah, Nevada, Washington, Wyoming, but um, outside of that, we don't have a network that we've built out. All right. Does, uh, do Wyoming holding companies need to file as a foreign LLC if its subsidiary LLC is in another state that flips property in that state? Joseph, if you have a Wyoming LLC set up here and you create a, an LLC over here in Illinois to flip real estate, and that Illinois LLC is owned by your Wyoming LLC. Your question is, do I need to foreign file this entity in Illinois? The answer to that is no, you do not. Because your blue box is not conducting business in Illinois. Now, you bring up a good point here. When it comes to foreign filing, I just dealt with this two weeks ago. There's a, a company, an, an internet entity mill, and I was talking to someone that had gone in and interviewed them about, he was explaining to me their process. What they do is they set everyone up with a Nevada LLC for their investment. So if you're gonna buy a piece of property in Illinois, they'll set you up with a Nevada LLC. Sometimes they register in Illinois, sometimes they don't. And he said, well, what's the problem with, with this strategy? I said, well, if you don't register your Nevada LLC in Illinois to hold the rental property that, it, that it's owning, then if you need to evict the tenant, you're not gonna be able to do it because you need to be registered. This entity here, Nevada, because it owns rental property, needs to be registered in Illinois. So now the issue is you set up an entity in Nevada, you have to pay fees here to Nevada, plus you have to pay fees over here to Illinois. And any benefit that you thought you may have by creating it in Nevada, once you register it in Illinois, you get zero of those benefits because now you fall under Illinois law. So you're falling into this trap where a company is forcing you to set it up in Nevada only to collect fees from you on an annual basis. Those fees should never have been created or any should never have been set up that way to put you into that position. So when you have rental real estate, you want to set up the entity in the state where the property is going to be held in that entity. It has to be registered there. In this case here, that you, the question you posed, the red box that owns the properties in Illinois, but the blue box, it doesn't own any Illinois real estate in my example, therefore it doesn't need to register there. Now, 
as you've heard me say many times, this isn't a one size fits all. Depending on what you're doing, this will change. My advice will change. For example, if you said, Clint, I'm gonna flip property in multiple states. Can I use a Wyoming LLC to flip property in multiple states without having to register? The answer to that is yes. So I'll show you a structure that I use on occasion for people. We'll set up a Wyoming LLC taxed as a corp. And then we will, or it could be in their state, doesn't matter, LLC. Then we'll create a Wyoming LLC up here, a couple Wyoming LLCs to take down their deal. So if they find a property that they, they're gonna flip in Florida, we'll just take it down in the Wyoming LLC and we'll flip it in the Wyoming LLC. If they find a deal in Texas, we'll do it directly. And we won't register that LLC in, the, in Florida or Texas unless we're required to do so because title won't close any other way. Now, why am I able to do this in this instance, but not over here when it's rentals? Because in this instance, I'm what, I'm what they call doing business in the state. I have regular and continuous business activity in that state. So that means I have to register there. Here, this is an isolated transaction, one and done. So I don't have to register in that situation because it's isolated. Now, if you're gonna keep flipping property in Florida, then I would say, listen, you, you just need to start registering there and set them up in Florida. But if you're just gonna do an isolated transaction, you could do it through a Wyoming company. So oftentimes I do this for clients this way because they get a deal and it's a 14 day close, right? Cash, waive all contingencies or in right of inspection, you just, you're competing with other individuals. You can't get an LLC set up in the state where you, say it was Florida, we couldn't get an LLC set up in time in Florida in 14 days because there are delays. So we have to set it up in Wyoming. I did a deal like that earlier this year and I got on the phone with Title and Title tried to tell my client they needed to register in Florida. And I put them right to the test. I said, give me the law that states we have to register in Florida to take title to property. They couldn't. I said, exactly, do your job. Your job is only to transfer title. It's not to advise my client on legal. And that just shut them right up because it's not. So this is, you can do it. They will accept it. And I've had a lot of clients that utilize this strategy. All right. Um, what about the Florida ladybird laws? Well, what that means is that you don't need a living trust. Um, you can set it up so that when you own the property, when you pass away, this house will go to your beneficiaries free of probate. Yeah, that's one way to do it. But remember, a living trust provides protection. If you put this in a living trust, when you pass away and you say, I want it to go to my beneficiaries when I'm no longer here, there's provisions in the living trust before it makes the distribution to your kids. It'll say, hey, what's going on with these kids? Are any of them involved in lawsuits? They're going through a divorce? Because if they've got some duress in their life, we're not gonna give them the asset right here now. We want them to get all that taken care of. We don't want that to go to a creditor or to an ex. Whereas if you use a ladybird deed, you've lost all control. As Soon as you're gone, they become the owners, creditors coming in, they take half the house, just like that. So it works, but you know, tools like that or, or solutions like that or that are built on simplicity tend to lead to outcomes that are uh, unanticipated. And so I, I, I don't like using them for that reason, Leah. All right. Do you recommend property purchased at an auction be immediately placed into a land trust? Um, and what's the lien protection for land trust? Okay, so if you buy property at an auction, Joseph, yeah, land trusts are a great way to do it. So what I'll often do is I, my clients will go down to auction with a couple of land trusts. We create a simplified trust that's three pages long. It's just real easy land trust. And if they get a property at auction, they will sign their trust right then and there and then go ahead and take title in the name of this land trust. Then what we'll do is they'll call us back up and we'll take this three page simple trust that doesn't have all the protections we want inside of it and we'll create the big boy trust for that asset. And then when we do that, of course, you know that we take make sure that their beneficial interest here is assigned over to a limited liability company like that because oftentimes they're going to start renting that property out. Now, once you close in this here, this stuff that takes place over here, no one knows about that because it's 
a private document, private transaction. Um, what's the lien protection? Well, there is no lien prote super lien protection with a land trust. If somebody has a right of action or a lien against that property and, and you bought it at auction, if it doesn't distinguish or extinguish, I mean, the lien, then the lien goes with the property. But once the properties, if you buy at auction, the property's in the trust and some, a creditor had a judgment against you because that property never hit your name, a personal judgment would not attach. And so in this, this client right here that I'm showing you, uh, this one's in Florida, we have a Wyoming LLC set up as his trustee of his land trust. So no one is aware that my client is involved with these transactions because as soon as he closes, we change the trust. We, it's called a restatement. We restate his land trust and we make his LLC the beneficiary. Actually, it's Florida. We use a Delaware series to these land trusts in Florida. Just throwing that out there just to let you know, it's not a one size fits all. It depends on what you're doing. All right, um, <clears throat> Steve, if I have a nonprofit, can I get an LLC so I could open up a gold jewelry business? Steve, you can create an LLC to open up a gold jewelry business, but you're not doing it through your nonprofit. Because if you did, you're gonna get taxed on that, okay? Because now you're involved in UBIT. Okay, that means you're engaging in a business activity. I assume that's why, I mean, you put business on there. You could have a nonprofit here. This is my nonprofit and I can create another business over here, an LLC, that's fine. But this can't be tied into that. That, that would not work. Okay, that, oh, I see you said under the nonprofit. Um, how would I handle corporations? For instance, would you recommend having your trust own your S corporation? Yes, I would have my trust own my S corporation, but here's what's important. When you set up your trust, you wanna make sure that it has subchapter S trust provisions inside of it. Because when you pass away, if you do not have these specific provisions inside of your living trust, your S corporation could be converted to a C corporation and that could create problems for you from a tax standpoint. So yes, we do it all the time, but you have to have a certain clause in there to ensure that the trust can hold the S corporation shares and doesn't blow it up. Um, this AMP, does someone need a will if they establish a living trust? Yes, you always need a will if you set up a living trust. So when we create an estate plan for someone, we will draft a living trust, we will draft a pour over will. And the reason we call it a pour over will Again, it picks up anything that was left outside of the trust that you forgot to put inside of there. I gave you the example of my client. The dad left out a business. We had to do a probate on it. Um, so you, you have a pour over will. We we'll also put together a financial uh, POA, power of attorney. So the financial power of attorney, what is its purpose? Well, again, if you don't have any, if you have your living trust set up and you forgot to transfer this bank account into your living trust and you're incapacitated, which is what happened to my wife's grandmother. She was in a coma and her daughter, successor trustee, discovered that there was a bank account. When the statement came in, it had her name listed on there, the, 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 the grandmother's name. She called up the bank and said, hey, my mom's in a coma. I need to transfer this account out of her name and into the trust so we don't have to go through probate. I'm the successor trustee. And they said, well, we can't help you because you only have control over assets that are held inside of the trust and this asset's outside of the trust. So she called me up and she said, what do I do? I said, just tell me you're the financial power of attorney because we did set it up where she was the financial power of attorney. So she went to the bank and said, hey, here's my power of attorney. Here's my mom, uh, uh, the, the medical doctor's certification that she's in a coma and, and is not is incompetent at this time. So I want to change the ownership on this account from her name to her living trust. Bank took a copy of it and then changed it so we avoided probate. We want to get a medical POA, power of attorney. That comes with any estate plan that should be set up for you. And this ensures that someone can make medical decisions on your behalf if you're no longer able to make those. You know, So, you, so they can give you, maybe they, you say, I don't want any fluids, I don't want any food, all I want are pain medications. And I, and I want to make sure that my daughter or my son is carrying this out or my spouse. 
And so this gives them the power to deal with the hospital. That's an important document. A living will is another one. It, it works hand in hand. It just reiterates your desires of what you want. So if your medical power of attorney is, is struggling with the hospital, then you just pull out the living will and say, here you go. This is, you can't get any clearer than this. These are his, his, his wishes. If he's ever in an irreversible vegetative state, this is how you're to handle him. Um, important documents. You probably remember some of you, the Terry Schiavo case out of Florida. Really interesting case there where uh, on, she was on life support for years because she brought home the living will. Or I forget what it was. They had the, the documents and she had them for a few days and she didn't sign them before she was involved in it was an accident. And then she's brain dead and the hospital would not take her off life support. They had, well, the, the parents didn't want to, I think it was the parents didn't want to take them off either. Uh, and so they were just draining all the assets. And so having these documents is critical. But you also want to have what's called a schedule of gifts. And this is where you list out all your personal effects that you want to go to certain people. Uh, so, so if you, Maybe you've got a watch, you want to go to your son, jewelry to go to your daughter, your daughter-in-law. You just you list that out there. Uh, and then those gifts would be made out of your estate. And it's really good because you should have the conversation with the kids so that you get an idea for what they have strong sentimental attachment or emotional attachment to of yours and that they can receive that. And, and then you address the issues ahead of time. If you have two kid, you know, two children, three kids, and they all want the same item. Well, you got to figure that out. It's easier to figure it out now and come to 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 a consensus than allow them to squabble about it after you're no longer here. And then you want, uh, on top of that, final instructions, letting people know how you'd like to be remembered. You, you should write all that out. And so these are the main documents. If you have kids, um, you want you know a declaration of guardian for, for minor children, and oftentimes that works in with the living trust as well. I've created provisions before where uh, people have said, well, I want my kids to go to this family over here. And, so, and I'll ask them, well, how many kids do they have? Well, they have three. And so you want your two children to go live with them. You want them to be the guardian. Yes, they agreed to be my, my guardian or guardian. Okay, great. How big is their house? Oh, it's not very big. It's 1,800 square feet. It's a, a three bedroom. Okay, great. So they're going to take on your kids and how are we gonna remodel the room so we can get three children or four children within one room? Oh, I didn't think about that. Exactly, that's why we're working together. So I've thought about it for you. Why don't we take some funds, specify in your living trust that we will give the guardians of your children X amount of money so they can get a larger property, something like that. Or in one case, what we did is we said that they would move into their house because the people that I was setting up the living trust for it. They had a 4,500, 6,000 square foot home, lots of bedrooms. So they could come and live there, sell their house, live in this house until the kids, the, the, their children reached 27 years of age and then it would pass over to the kids. So you can do things like that inside side of a living trust. All right. Um, do, you, do I have to pay a state's real estate withholding tax for out of state sales? Uh, I'm not sure about the out-of-state sales and paying the, the state taxes on that um, when, when you sell. I mean, if you sold real estate and there's the taxes associated with it, you're responsible to pay those taxes. But I'm not all about running a business. Sorry, Victor, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, Judy, I have a California LLC for out-of-state rentals. I'm realizing now that's not the best. Would you recommend I move them to a Wyoming limited liability company? And what's the best way to do so? Judy, I'd recommend that you set up a strategy session with us because to break this down, it's going to depend on where your rentals are located. I wouldn't set up a Wyoming LLC for them directly unless they're located in Wyoming. Because you live in California, we would be looking at using a statutory trust in Wyoming to hold LLCs in the state where your property is located. So we would set something up like this. I'd set you up with a Wyoming Statutory Trust. And then I would have that Statutory Trust hold the, the LLCs in the state where the property is located. Why? Because California is gonna nick you 800 bucks for every LLC that you own. So 
To avoid that, we use this statutory trust here to own the interest in the out-of-state LLCs. You own the statutory trust. Nothing's registered in California, and you're not subject to the $800 franchise fee. So it gets a little, it's not that it's complicated. We're just using different entities to produce the same result in a way that's more efficient for you uh, in setting this overall structure up. If I have my primary res residence designated as an LLC for three Airbnbs, is that a problem with capital gains? Airbnb primary residence stopped in April. Do I need, still need to wait two years? All right, so, so what you're saying is that you're using um, your house is inside of a limited liability company and you're using it as an Airbnb throughout the year. And so when you go to sell under section 121, is this gonna be an issue for you? Yeah, it's gonna be an issue for you if you're treating it as a rental property. It could be mixed use there, so a portion of it could be uh, under 121, but yeah, you may want, you know, wait after two years, um, wait for two years and once you, if you stop doing Airbnb, if you wanna get the full 121 gain exclusion. Or what you could do is just, you know, keep it as an Airbnb, move out, borrow some money out, go buy another, another residence, and that way you don't have to sell it. Or you could do a 1031 exchange Okay, so, so another way to do this is do a 1031 exchange on this investment property and do a new property over here because it would qualify if you treat it as an investment property. Now you've got a 1031 exchange, properties held in an LLC, move into that property now, make that your personal residence, live in it for five years, and then you can turn around and sell it and capture the 121. So you can get there, just, you know, we're gonna have to do a few little dance steps uh, to make it work out. You got, you got a follow up here. If I have uh, two rental properties in Florida under one limited liability company, should I have two LLCs? Should I set it up under a Wyoming LLC? I, I mean, if you got two rental properties in Florida under one limited liability company, um, if you want anonymity, I would do that. If you want additional asset protection, I would separate them out. You could do this. You could keep the one LLC here. Uh, if they have debt on the properties, we're gonna use a land trust so you don't have any dock stamps. We could, we could dump one of those properties over here into a land trust, do that, and then you could set it up this way. There's a couple of different ways we, we could go with your structure once we knew more of the details, the debt on the property, how that's set up. Um, but also keep in mind, I mean, you do have asset protection if, the way it's set up. If something were to happen with that LLC, with one of those properties, you risk losing the properties, but you're protected. It's not the ideal situation because you don't want to lose two properties in one lawsuit. So I would look at, at separating those out and try and figure out the best way to do that. Uh, the Wyoming LLC is a great, from an anonymity standpoint, if you don't want your tenants to know, if you're not self-managing, um, or if you do self-manage your future tenants, you don't have to let them know you're the owner. You can just say you, you manage these properties for the owner. And that's not lying. People say, well, you're, you're misleading people. The hell I am. They're owned by LLCs. They're not owned by me. So if I tell you I don't own them, I am being 100% accurate. I could say that under oath and you couldn't ding me for it in court because I don't own the properties, right? My, I don't have to tell you that I own the LLCs that own the property. All right. If I sell a California property and receive $300,000 in taxable gains and a few weeks later I find a property located in uh, an OZ, would I be able to utilize the tax incentives of the OZ? Yes, you can. If you find an OZ property, you can roll the $300,000 in. Now, I was just talking to a client today, one of our platinum clients, longtime client, she's a physician. We had the same discussion about buying property in Dallas. Thing was, she sold the asset, she, she, brought, she received $360,000. Now, she wants to buy an asset valued at say 1.2 million. Well, during our conversation, I found out only 60,000 of that is gain. So if you're gonna go into an OZ fund, you only roll the gain in, not the 300 basis. Now, why is that an issue? Because if you're gonna buy a $1.2 million property, you're gonna to need to have at least you know, $400,000 maybe down in order to qualify between three to $400,000. She only got 60. So if she rolled all 360 in, 
it, she's not going to get the benefit in 10 years because when you put after tax money into an OZ, you then limit how much of your gain in the future will be tax free to you. So you got to run the numbers to make sure that you're going to. Now, if you're rolling 300 in and you need an extra 150, I would structure it as debt, do a personal loan to the LLC to make up that difference and then go out and get the primary financing, maybe using a QM, non-QM lender, probably non-QM if you're going to close if it's non, uh, if it's residential, close on that deal, but have it all structured on your tax return as debt plus the gain that you rolled in. Never want to roll in um, principal into there. My attorney said I don't need a trust because in Florida they have ladybird deeds. Yeah, we talked about that, Leah. You're right, you do, but I brought up some of the problems uh, that can occur there. Uh, what do you typically use as a registered agent for your property specific LLCs that are subsidiaries? Uh, we serve as registered agents in all 50 states. And so we don't want to have our clients information on there. We want to keep it protected at all times. Uh, if I sell a property and receive 300K in capital gains and a few weeks later I use those proceeds to purchase a property in an OZ zone. Oh, yeah, we talked about that. Yeah, uh, that one came up again. Um, Glad you appreciate it, Joseph. Um, does the Declaration of Guardian work in Canada? I'm not sure, Leela, if it does. Um, what do you think about Nevis um, Island Company for holding an LLC? You know, we don't set up offshore. Um, I typically, I refer them out to a guy named Brian Bradley uh, that, that works on, he does a strategy onshore, offshore, but I might, Anderson, we do not uh, set those up. And, and, you know, I've talked to him and I've got a, a video that will be coming out that, that discusses this on my channel. And, and I think there's, there's a place for it for certain individuals. Uh, it can provide an additional layer of asset protection. Uh, can you do cost seg on a mobile home? I don't know. I don't think you can uh, do cost seg on a mobile home. But I'm only 90% positive on that one. Does a living trust protect your assets from nursing home? Wow, Kathy, I just, that's another call I had today. Today I had a ton of phone calls and uh, this person called me up. Her husband is got a lot of problems, medical problems. He's gonna need Medicaid, he's gonna apply for that. And they'd already talked to someone about the spend down uh, that they would have to go through in order to qualify, spend up their, all their assets. And the wife is telling me, she said, I'm not gonna have anything left basically to live on. And I said, I know that's unfortunate living trust she wanted to set up a living trust and i said it's not going to help you um i know i appreciate you want to use my services but it's not going to benefit you so i'm the wrong guy what do you do unfortunately in that situation you got to get a divorce and do a division of the assets if you want to protect your surviving spouse and it, it's that's a tough one for people to 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 bite off uh so she's been married for 50 years 60 years but it's out of love that you do it more than anything else is what I've always told people. Uh, do you have any more information for DLPs for people in California? I love this topic. Um, so disregarded, uh, I know you keep asking, I saw, your, I saw the question uh, on my YouTube channel today. Uh, Mike, the thing about uh, the disregarded limited partnerships, I don't have any more information. I don't think I've done a video on that. Maybe look at that California state. There's one, I think I did a video on California strategies. Check that on my channel, search California. Uh, you may find uh, that video there. The disregarded limited partnership, you can do it, set it up the way we set them up in California. And the reason why people do this in California is so they don't have to pay the, the franchise, $800 franchise tax on it. You set up your LP. If you want anonymity, you have a Wyoming LLC down here, which is the beneficiary. And then up top, you would set up a California LLC that is also that is disregarded, that is owned 100% by this. So this is the general partner. This is a limited partner down here. And because it's all disregarded through here down to you, then this entity is a disregarded entity as well because it's the same taxpayer on both sides. That's how you would, you would set up a disregarded LP. The disregarded LP is based upon the federal tax election you make. And because it's all disregarded down to one, it, it would qualify. So, so 
that's what we do there. Um, yeah, Florida has a five-year look back. Why is it called Anderson Advisors and not Coons Advisors? Um, I spoke to, to a, a, a gentleman about this last week. He, he used to work with Arthur Anderson, and, I, and he told me that. And I said, you know, when we created the firm, we set it up. We chose the name Anderson Advisors because at that time there were phone books, right? And we were going to advertise in the phone book, biggest waste of money. And we wanted to be an A. So we did that. So that's one reason. The second reason was that everyone knew of Arthur Anderson. They were a very popular, well-respected CPA and accounting firm. We thought, hey, we got a name Anderson. You know, Anderson's run for a judge. They always get elected, right? So he said, let's go with Anderson and make it a trade name. Uh, and so that's what it be, why it became Anderson. Now, a little backstory here you might find funny. So during this time, we actually had another partner named Anderson that worked with us, and, and uh, he was a partner in the firm. So it was myself, Toby Mathis, and, and Bob Anderson. We started this firm. He thought it was named after him, and it had nothing to do with him when we named this firm. We trademarked it. We specified it in the operating agreement. This is why operating agreements are so important. So when we finally kicked him out because he wasn't working and we were doing all the work, um, he tried to get us to remove the name. He went to court and he said, oh, you can't use the name Anderson any longer because you named it after me. It's like, all right, you, you did nothing while you were with us and now you just want to sit there and lie to the court. And so this was a potential problem for us because if they made us stop, they told us we could no longer use the name Anderson because it was named after a person who left the firm, then that would cause a lot of financial hardship for us because we'd spent so much money in marketing and building up the firm with that name. So under the uh, RPCs of the state of Washington, it stated that you know you gotta have a, a named partner. If you named after one of the partner, that partner leaves. If there isn't another Anderson in the firm, then you gotta drop the name. So to, to thwart this guy, I went down and actually changed my last name, hyphenated it to Clinton Anderson hyphen Coons. And then uh, went back into court. We had a hearing that day about the name. And he said, oh, there's no Andersons. I said, the hell? I'm an Anderson. No, he's not. His last name is Coons. And I said, yeah, it was until two days ago. And now it's Anderson. <laughs> so uh, in a way, it is named after me. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mike, so we are holding company LLC B taxes, C corporation. No, the holding company is all going to be disregarded that everything's disregarded there um, any advice for people who want to start investing we have no properties just cash for a down payment Peter what I would tell you do the numbers man numbers do not lie do not make it emotional uh, this is something that happens a lot with people they want to buy real estate and <clears throat> they just to buy real estate to say I'm a real estate investor and own property and I get it that can creep into it when you're first starting out check your numbers always check your numbers to make sure that that deal's going to pencil. And if it's not, there's plenty other deals out there. You will get one. So many people make that first deal and they make that mistake because they buy on emotion and it only comes back, they regret it later on. I've seen it, you know, 20 some years of practice. I've seen it far too often. Uh, if I use a disregarded Wyoming LLC managed by my California Corp to flip houses, my C Corp is owned by my Wyoming Holding LLC. How would I set up my structure for long-term rental properties in California? So in your case, if you had this set up like this, so this is California, and you've got an LLC up here, and you're flipping, and here's your Wyoming LLC down here, and now you want to start, let me get rid of this, now you want to start buying rentals in California, I would set up a WST if you don't want to pay the franchise fees. If you don't care about that, then I would use a California LLC all owned by this one, just like this. That's how I would, and so your rental stuff's over here, separate from, from your, your, your flipping activities. All right, guys, I got time here for a few more and then I'm gonna have to, to run. Uh, great, you have an appointment with Corey tomorrow, excellent. Um, and Kenny, how does a land trust get a full liability protection from an LLC owned by a Wyoming LLC? Should deed into LLC instead? Kenny, here's how it works. If you have a land trust over here, okay, and it's owned by a limited liability company right here, so you've got this structure in place, land trust to 
Um, say this was Texas LLC and the Texas LLC for anonymity purposes is held by Wyoming LLC. If the lawsuit originates here with the property, goes against the trust, and then it comes down here to the beneficiary of the trust, which is your Texas LLC. So the most you have at risk is this, which is the same as if you just did this, right? If you just put the property into the LLC directly, you just lose it right here. The land trust is just an additional step that we use for, for, for other reasons. Uh, maybe it's a due on sale clause, a, a concern for you, or you bought it at auction, you're moving it in. So anyways, guys, it's been great. I know I went 30 minutes over and um, I do have dinner plans. My wife will, will hang me out to dry if I'm not home in time. So uh, I wanna thank you for joining me. We're gonna be back here in a few weeks and we got another topic lined up for you. Uh, I appreciate all the comments and, and the views on, on the channel. Uh, when you go there, tell your friends about it as well if they're real estate investors. And be sure to join us on our tax and asset protection event that's coming up. It'll be here uh, this coming Saturday. I, the, the links have been uh, popping up there in the, in the uh, chat. And hey, I got a new book that's going to be released next week. It's called Next Level Real Estate Asset Protection. Uh, you can find it on Amazon. It's, it's a, it's a follow-up to my first book, Asset Protection for Real Estate Investors, where you know, I take my experiences that I've learned in my own investing and, and showing you how you can take your investing to another level and how entities can actually help you do more uh, if they're set up the right way using that three-legged stool approach that I tend to talk about asset protection, tax planning, and business planning. Be sure to check it out. It's, it's, it's trending right now. I, I think in one of the categories already number one. It hasn't even been released yet. So that's awesome to hear. And other than that, keep watching, keep yourself protected. Get on my event. I wish you the very best with what you're doing with your investing. Take care, guys. See you soon.